Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we welcome Chris Coyne, who is a professor of economics at George Mason University and a senior fellow at the Independent Institute in Oakland, California. He is the author of the new book, In Search of Monsters to Destroy, and his website is ccoyne.com. That's C-C-O-Y-N-E dot com. Chris Coyne, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. It's wonderful to be here with you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for writing this book. Um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong on anything, I, I think we want to end wars for very different reasons. And I wonder if we can explore that without disagreeing so much that we can't work together on ending wars. Uh, so maybe I should start with this. Why do you want to end wars? Uh the reason I want to end wars is they are the most devastating act that human beings can take against other human beings. It has devastating consequences on all aspects of life, on uh, physical aspects of life, on um, economic aspects of life, on social aspects of life, on political aspects of life. And and for that simple reason, uh, and uh, uh, I'm not sure if we, we will disagree, but I'd love to hear your your thoughts on that. We haven't disagreed yet. What about what about militarism, war planning, war preparations, weapons production, weapons dealing around the globe? Do you want to end those things or just? Oh, do certainly. Them no, no, certainly. So, so you know, that part of the reason this book is written is to it's not the only audience, but it's to engage people I often interact with who are more right leaning on economic issues. But when it comes to matters of of the military. Um, they are they they are very much embrace it, um, especially you know. So they they will say, government is terrible at education. It's terrible at healthcare. We can't have government do those things. But then they want government to intervene all around the world and to build schools and to build hospitals and engage in the very things that they are critiquing domestically. They want to do them at a, a much bigger scale abroad. Uh, and so uh, what I'm trying to to highlight to to these folks and to anyone who are in, is interested in these issues is, is look. All of the issues that you raise with with domestic government programs are amplified abroad. And it's not just that they're amplified, that they have the same effects as domestic programs. They're much worse. They erode the very things that these folks purport to care about, liberties, freedoms, um, human rights. And on top of that, to go back to your point, it destroys economic well-being. Every dollar, you know, a lot of economists talk about kind of the guns and butter trade off as if it, there's kind of this smooth trade off and you can just pick and you can somehow have this optimal welfare for the country. I don't view things that way. A dollar spent on producing a bomb uh, is different than a dollar spent on food. It's a dollar sp different than a dollar spent on education. It's true that it's a dollar is a dollar, but those things have very different welfare effects. Uh, and so that's why, why why I try to highlight in one of the chapters in the book the er eroding effects that the military sector has on markets, on economic well-being. So it sounds like you want to end wars more than you want to end public schools or health care or Social Security or environmental protection. Uh, am oh, I certainly. Right? Oh, certainly. I, I, look, if, 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 if I had my uh, and of course, all these things take place in actual politics and they're all it's a messy world. But if I had my pecking order, you know, the 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 the, the warfare state or the, the American empire, I use that term very broadly to include activities abroad, the kind of culture that underpins it, the arms trade. The military sector uh, that would be my my top priority and and that's kind of the purpose of the book to really bring this to the forefront as i've had conversations and i've worked with and have many friends and allies who identify as libertarian or something along those lines and i've tried many times to propose a collaboration a compromise where we say let's work to get a huge chunk of money out of military spending and put half of it into tax cuts for gazillionaires or whatever you want, and half of it into the things that I see as useful and you see as evil, healthcare, schools, parks, environmental protection, et cetera. And not a single one of them ever has said they would even consider that idea because it was just against their principles to support government spending. Uh, it, it sounds to me like from what you've said thus far, like you ought to support such a compromise. Oh, certainly. I mean, look, the, again, there, I think there's a difference between 
kind of the, the first best normative vision of the world and, and the world we live in. And in the world we live in, certainly there's these political compromises. And so if you presented me, um, by the way, I, I, I do consider myself a, a small L libertarian. I'm not part of the libertarian party, um, but, I, but I do subscribe to what, what many people consider liberal, classical liberal or libertarian principles in terms of my personal political philosophy. And so if you offered me the trade-off that you just laid out, I certainly would take it. I, I, by the way, I wouldn't want tax cuts for gazillionaires or billionaires, I don't know what term you used, without a, a equivalent spending cuts. I, again, I think this is a huge mistake that a lot of people on the right often make. It's tax cuts for the sake of tax cuts. And uh, government spending without and, and just straight up tax cuts is, is horrible. And, and, it, and, and we're seeing that right now. And, and uh, it's irresponsible. It's irresponsible policy. But that's beyond beyond war making itself. I think when I first, you know, started working on opposing war uh, and thinking and writing about it, my reasons were basically what you started with. It's the most horrible thing. It's organized mass murder. What could be worse? But the more I looked at it, uh, the more I saw the good that could be done with the money that's put into the wars. When 3% of U.S. military spending is the figure that the U.N. says spent annually could end starvation on Earth. When you look at the you know, fraction of that that it would take to provide the world with clean drinking water, when you look at the tiny amounts that it would take to go beyond the wildest dreams of environmental activists in terms of a Green New Deal or investment in public transit or any useful thing in the U.S. or around the globe, uh, wars clearly kill most significantly in the largest numbers by taking money from where it would do good to where it does bad. Uh, but if, if our goal is to, is to prevent death and suffering, don't we want to invest in such things as food and health care and environment? Yeah, my response to that is potentially. And I know that sounds the way you've set it up. It's like, of course, we want to invest in those things. And here's why I say potentially. It depends on the actual real world policies. So here, let me let me be a little more concrete. I can envision, and we don't have to go back that far. Let's talk about the last presidential administration, for instance, as an example, po political actors that I would not want to have more political power. Because, of course, all the things you're mentioning sound good, but they're going to be implemented to the extent they're implemented in the political space through political institutions. So I would want to know more about, and this would require a, a real world context, about who's going to implement these things, about who's going to have positions of political power. Because, of course, one of the concerns that I think you and I share is that private corporations, private actors, oftentimes become entangled with pol the political space and are able to redirect resources that are intended for the public interest broadly understood, and they line their own pro uh, pockets. It becomes a corporate welfare program. And so that's the kind of thing I would be cognizant about with those concerns, the, the, the projections when it talks about the cost of ending starvation or poverty. I'm all for those things, but they oftentimes kind of hold constant the political factors. The, the, they take for granted that you can just spend money and get the outcome you want. And we, we know that there's numerous cases throughout just the post-World War II period, but even much further back, of well-intentioned aid assistance programs that have done great harm. And where those programs do more harm than good, I want to avoid them. And so I, I try to avoid saying, you know, we could just spend that money over here and get the outcome we want. And that's why I say potentially. I, I, I'd be, I would be open to those conversations, by the way. I would not push it off the table to start with. The one other thing I just want to mention is in addition to that, the other thing we need to think about is not just monetary resources, but human talent. And so a scientist, an entrepreneur who invests their time, their effort, their company in satisfying the wants of war planners can't satisfy the wants of, of private consumers. They can't come up with a, a better product, a way of providing a better service to improve the well-being of private consumers. And that's the other aspect. So it's not just the monetary resources. It's that it redirects a lot of the desirable features of markets. And it redirects them from making people better off to making politicians and those in the military sector better off and people with political power abroad who are often running or involved with the worst governments in the world. Um, and so I, I think that's the other aspect of this that I would highlight.
Absolutely. I mean, if you put 3% of U.S. military spending into trying to end starvation around the world, you would have people putting their brains to that project of trying to figure out how to have a world without starvation. And if it took 6% because of incredible corruption uh, and mismanagement, it would still only be 6%. I mean, it, is, it, it would be, it would actually be attempting something very, very much worthwhile, right? I mean, it wouldn't, uh, I, I, I would, I would consider it a success uh, if, if it had that incredible level of failure. So it, it seems to me well worth the effort, unlike, you know, trying to improve the world with bombs. Oh, certainly, certainly. Again, we, we know this, you know, our, our discussion and, and our potential disagreements, which again, I don't know how, how much there is now, but that aside, I think we agree that built, bom you can't eat bombs. You can't, you can't make people better off the bombs. Bombs, war making in general is inherently destructive. And so that is a surefire way to reduce human welfare and well-being. We know that. And so whether we have success or failure or the alternative path we take, we can discuss that, and I'm all for it. But we know for certain that, that war is not the, 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 the way to prosperity. The idea of perpetual war for perpetual peace makes no sense. And in some sense, you know, it's like a, a cyclical process where what, what old is new again. We're back in a world where we have to increase military budgets. We need to, to, you know, nuclear threats. We need to have nuclear deterrence because somehow, you know, we pretend again that that's the, the solution for peace. And you're just we've cycled around to where we were not too long ago. And and that's what I find most most troubling. And if we if you and I were in a situation where we could have these conversations about how to redirect these resources, I'd be as happy as can be. Um, and so so from that standpoint, you and I are, are, are on the same page in terms of, of being unified in our purpose. I, I agree very much with that. Um, we're speaking with Chris Coyne, Christopher Coyne, who is a professor of economics at George Mason, and the book is In Search of Monsters to Destroy. Um, I, I would love it if every economics professor would put their mind to, uh, to ending war and ceasing to seek out monsters to destroy. Uh, my, my hesitation about giving a book that's part anti-war, part right-wing or libertarian economics to somebody, unless I know that that's their economic perspective, is that it seems to suggest in the book that somebody who wants uh, the government to invest in schools or trains is just sort of a question of a few degrees short of being a, a warmonger. They, they have sort of power mad, sadistic tendencies, uh, and they're just a little bit short of, you know, of, of you know, jumping on the nukes and dropping out of the planes. Uh, is that is that true? Is it the same sort of mental fault that makes you want schools that makes you also want wars? No, no, it's not the same. And 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 if I if I did come across that that way, or I do in the book, it's it's not the intention of it. I, I, I here's here's how I would frame it: governments inherently are centralized power. That's what a government is. And that power can be directed in a, a host of different ways. And so this is what, what political philosophers oftentimes refer to as the paradox of government, which is how do you empower a group of people to do things? So you have to give them political control once either you've selected them through elections or, how, or they're appointed as bureaucrats, however, whatever selection mechanisms there are. But that with that power can come good, but also can come harm. And I mean, just look around the United States right now. There is significant variation in public services. I, I don't think that's disputable. There are places where political actors have used their political power not to advance the interests of their constituents, but to line their own pockets, to line the pockets of those that are politically connected and so on. That goes with schooling. That goes with police. That goes with public services, like basic things like water. I mean, think about that. There are places in this country where people don't have access to water. That's crazy. And so my my thinking is, depending on the context, and again, this is where we were talking about earlier with, with, with government programs when we were talking about broader things like healthcare and schooling and so on, it depends on the context and the incentives people face and the ability of the constituents that live within a polity to check those in political power. It depends on the effectiveness of other branches of even local governments to check them and so on. And so I'm a big fan of self-governance. I'm a fan of collective action. I understand there's collective action problems, meaning people need to work together 
in order to solve problems. And government, at least in the ideal form, is a manifestation of that. We can come together as a polity at whatever level we're talking about and work together to achieve some goal we, we agree on. But also on top of that, we need to prevent one group, whether it's the, if we have a, a majority type system, the majority from abusing the minority once they take power. And that's the concern. And, and that can happen in schooling, it can happen in healthcare, it can happen in policing, it can happen in war. They're not the same because going back to where we started war, you know, again, bombs are different than school books. And, 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 and so I'm not trying to make an equivalency argument between them. What, what I am pointing out is that the, the paradox of government and the need to check that. And so that's what I'm talking about with the paradox of government in the book. And again, most of it's focused on the war making state. And I think that's the area where the most perverse effects of politics come to the forefront because at the national level, it's very hard for citizens to know what's going on because of secrecy, because of propaganda. Uh, it's, you know, how would an ordinary voter get information about what government is doing? We can get broad numbers like budgets. And even those are oftentimes often there's hidden line, uh, line items in, 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 uh, for, for, for military operations. And we oftentimes have to rely on whistleblowers, of course, which comes after the fact. Um, and so that, that's why I think there's a fundamental difference in kind between those activities, even though the, the parallel is that politicians are carrying them out. And, and of course, without wars and militarism, there would be no justification for the secrecy. Uh, and we could demand more openness. And even currently, there's only one department of the U.S. government that isn't audited, that, that doesn't have to show its show its books. It uh, doesn't mean the other departments are all free of corruption. But if we're going to look around this little corner of the globe and see which spots are doing better and worse, we could look at the other 96% of humanity sometimes, too. Uh, we could acknowledge that, that Europe exists and Asia exists and Scandinavian governments do what the, the radical socialists in the United States don't dare dream of advocating. Uh, I, I mean, when I read in your, your book about how corrupt, uh, you know, how corrupt a, a government healthcare system would be, I have to look around the world and, and see that the U.S. privatized health insurance system is spending over twice as much uh, as anybody else for worse outcomes when it comes to health care. And we're theorizing, well, how could we make, you know, public health insurance work in theory when it's working? It's just working outside the, the borders of this little 4% of humanity. We, we do have to look outside those borders, right? Oh, of course, of course. I, by the way, I, I can't, I have to go back and look. I don't think I called government involvement in healthcare corrupt in the book. I don't think I go into that level of detail. Um, it is corrupt. It is, it, yeah, yeah, it, it is wasteful. It is wasteful in the United States. It's heavily wasteful. Um, I, would, I would argue, I think you'd agree with that. Um, you know, and so certainly there are other countries, as you point out, that are able to provide services in a way that's different and perhaps more effective than the United States. I don't, I don't deny that. Whether we can mimic that here is another question. Now, now here's the, here's the question in, or, or, or thing I would respond with. When you try to have government expand its involvement, given the status quo in the United States, what happens? Well, it could get better. But it actually could get worse because the, the, the current status quo, you can't just you don't start from a blank slate. So this is a practical political question. How do you move from the here and now to the to the a better vision and spending more money, giving politicians more power? I think I don't know. And this is a point of discussion could lead to worse outcomes because private insurers aren't going away. Um, and I think we see part of this with the Affordable Care Act. Certainly it did some good things. But it also led to expansive ent entanglements between private firms who are lobbying government to, to influence regulations, to shape regulations, to benefit themselves. Uh, and uh, then people end up blaming the market. We don't, we don't have a free market in healthcare in the United States. We, ha we have a, a heavily entangled system, just like the banking system and the military sector, by the way. But this was not uh, the, the, the Affordable Care Act was an act, but it wasn't affordable and it wasn't useful and it wasn't uh, aimed at providing people efficient uh, health care as a human right. It was drafted by 
the insurance companies. They didn't get entangled with it. They created it and they pushed it through right wing think tanks. Uh, and so, you know, this is not uh, the model. I think we can agree on that. But the oh, certainly. incredible inefficiency in the United States comes from those private health insurance companies. Well, it comes, it comes from the entanglement. It, the, the, the only reason those private health insurance companies can do what they do is because government largesse, which offers profit. And so it's a, there's a back and forth between them, certainly. But where, what's driving that? It's unclear. I think there's both. I think it's, it's driven in both directions, which is that politicians like stuff, too. They like getting elected. They like having money. Uh, they like rewarding their friends and punishing their enemies. Uh, and so... Uh, wh where you put the point of emphasis, I think, is, is certainly an area for discussion. But I, I don't think for any of these things, it's purely private actors driving. it. I think it's a back and forth between the two. Well, there isn't a question of whether health insurance companies uh, interact with the government. <laughs> the question is whether the government might do better if they didn't exist. Uh, and that question can be answered fairly well by looking at dozens of other governments around the world where they don't have private insurance companies and they provide health coverage more efficiently. Well, again, I, I think, it, first of all, I think it depends on the specific case you're talking about. And we have to talk about at what level of efficiency. So here's what I mean by that. And again, this is beyond the scope of the book, but I'm happy, happy to have this, the discussion. So the book, just for those listening, is not about healthcare. It's maybe one line in passing, but it's an interesting conversation to have nonetheless. In healthcare, we face scarcity. There are scarce resources, just like everything. So we have to make trade-offs. And, 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 and everyone recognizes this, even if they think, well, scarcity, what are you talking about? A dollar spent on health care is a dollar you can't spend on schooling to store on roads, which means there's trade-offs. You have to make decisions about where to allocate things. And those allocations are going to be made by someone. And whether you believe that a government agency can make them more effectively than private decision makers is up for debate. And again, I'm willing to have that discussion. I will say this. There is no clear path right now to the kind of system you're talking about in the United States. That doesn't mean it can't happen, by the way. So I'm not saying that. I'm saying I, my, my skepticism of this is exactly the one you raised about the Affordable Care Act, which is my concern is anytime we, we have something in the current setup that is supposed to push us away from that, it seems to push us more into the kind of the cesspool. And I don't know how to break out of that. I don't know how to get out of that that cycle. Now you might say, we'll just get rid of the insurance companies, which might, might be a way out of it. But even that, I'm not sure how you get out of it. I'm talking practical now in terms of practical politics. Um, now making moves and agitating just like in war, because someone could push back on us and they've pushed back on me. And I'm sure you, cause you, this is your world. I'm talking about war now. They'll say, that's not practical. This exists. And we can push, we have responses to that. And I imagine you can make similar responses when it comes to healthcare to that. But that's the, the immediate challenge. I think with the kind of shift you're, you're, you're proposing. Yeah, well, that's exactly my perspective is if we're if we want to talk about what we really want, we want to yep. abolish war. I also want to abolish health insurance companies, and I'm not sure which sounds more crazy to, to how many people. But uh, well, it I, depends. I, I mean, I mean, it depends. Then uh, again, it's it, you know, abolishing war gets rid of war. Abolishing healthcare companies still keeps government in charge of healthcare. So then you have to ask yourself, well, do you want Donald Trump running health, your your healthcare? Uh, do you want you know? You know, David Hume, the philosopher, the famous Scottish Enlightenment philosopher, had something he called Hume's political maxim. And I think it's always it's not a stopping argument, but I think it's a good thought experiment. He said, when you're thinking about political rules, imagine he called it the knave. Imagine the knaves in charge in, in contemporary terms. Think of your least desirable politician running the show and think about if you'd want to give them control over your aspect of that life. Uh, and Again, that's not a stopping argument, but it's something to, to a thought experiment and a reason for pause, I think, oftentimes when, when centralizing power, even in the name of good. No question whatsoever. No disagreement. But I don't think we could abolish war or health insurance companies with those clowns in power. Uh, yep. And I do think we have to look at all the other places that have abolished war and health insurance companies uh, and have the same DNA as the people in the United States. Um, I. I I also uh, wanted to ask your advice, Chris Coyne, because uh, I, I, I actually, despite my fondness for disagreeing and debating and arguing, I agree with the vast majority of this book because it's about ending war. And I don't find it that difficult to to support and agree with. 
But in this corrupt political system we're living in, the only voices in the major media outlets for ending war right now uh, or for opposing ongoing endless escalation of war in Europe are either people who want to shift to a war on China or people who want to shift to shooting at immigrants on the southern border of the United States or people who want to push racism and bigotry of all flavors. How do I, how do I agree with these people? that we need a ceasefire in Ukraine when I don't agree with them on anything else. How do how do we do this? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think it's a matter of personal perspective and strategy. You know, some people and you were mentioning some of these folks earlier in the libertarian, that's like all or nothing. And I refuse to have these conversations. And there's there are those folks and you can't talk to them. Well, it's very hard to talk to them unless you agree with everything. You know, I, I think that normatively, so so kind of first best, ideally, the world vision we have I personally think there's numerous opportunities to interact with people. And in my own life, I have found a, a sympathetic conversation uh, more often on, on topics of war with those that consider themselves left leaning. Um, I don't consider myself right leaning. I'm a libertarian, but the way my notion of libertarianism, which is a cosmopolitan libertarianism, would pull on aspects of what in the American kind of ideological spectrum some people would consider far left. And so some people would consider right. And so I don't consider myself conservative. I don't consider myself right leaning. In fact, the most the harshest audiences I've interacted with on these topics have been conservative audiences. If I was talking about entrepreneurship in those settings, they would have loved what I was saying. But, you know, you start talking about war and how wars is is is, is, a, is an enormous government program and wasteful and harmful. And they take it. They take deep offense. And so my my own view is we just have to look for these opportunities for engagement with people. And you're exactly right. In the world now, certainly in the American political landscape, there's not many allies for us, certainly not at the national level. Uh, and so uh, all I think we can do is, is uh, several things, not all we can do, I think it's important work, is continue to promote the message, but also, as you've long done throughout your career, promote a, a quite – Minute left, by the way. Okay. Promote a strong message. It's not just we need a little less spending. It's not that we just need to cut it a little bit. It's we can get rid of it. And that sounds radical to most people. But, you know, not long ago, it was quite radical to say you shouldn't be able to own people. Or it was quite radical to say uh, women should be allowed to vote. And if you look back at the at the discussions of those things, people would say that's radical. It's crazy. This is the way things have to be. This is how it's always been. We abolish slavery. Women have the ability to vote and we can abolish war. And so any moves towards that, I'm all on board. Could not agree more. Uh, I recommend that, that people check out the book. It's called In Search of Monsters to Destroy by our guest, Chris Coyne, who is a professor of economics at George Mason University and a senior fellow at the Independent Institute in Oakland, California. Chris Coyne, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.